Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name's Louise Cottrell. I head up communications at Kashi. I just want to say, on behalf of everyone at Kashi, thank you so much for coming out. And what an incredible New York February day. My gosh, that weather. <laughs> um, we're absolutely delighted to, hear, to be here with so many people who are interested like we are in advancing organic agriculture in the US. We've got a fabulous range of people from journalists, academics, farmers, young farmers, um, people across the industry. So welcome everyone. Um, at Kashi, we really passionately believe that food has the power to make a positive change, not just in ourselves, but in the world. And so that's why we're really passionate about increasing accessibility to organic food. Um, consumers are demanding it, we're demanding it, everybody wants it. But yet, less than 1% of farmland in the US is organic. Just as an example, in our recipes alone, there's not enough organic almonds grown in the US <clears throat> to even meet our own needs. So there's a huge constraint on American grown supply. And one of the big issues is because uh, the economic barriers that farmers face transitioning to organic. The move from conventional to organic is a three year process. During that time, they're following organic practices, but they can only sell their products and crops at, at conventional prices. There's no market for that crop. So there's a huge financial barrier as they invest more time, more infrastructure, potentially lower yields, but yet there's no return until the end of the third year. We believe that needs to change. And so last year, we partnered with a third party a group called Quality Assurance International to develop a protocol that recognizes and rewards those farmers who are going through that three year transition. What that does is it gives them a premium for their crops that are grown in that three year period and helps them get over some of those financial barriers that they might be facing. The goal is not to just increase organic agriculture for Kashi and Kashi's foods, but to really increase agriculture across the whole of the US, because that's the only way that we will exceed the 1% figure today. We believe certified transitional is really the way to increase accessibility to organic and create sustainable agriculture that's both sustainable for the environment and sustainable economically. We have an amazing panel here today, spreading across all of the agricultural spectrum, and they're delighted to talk to you today, not just about certified transitional, but how each of us in the room can really make a difference in increasing that 1% number. Our moderator today is Melanie Hanshi. She is the Editorial Director, Organic Life. Absolutely delighted to have you. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Melanie's got 16 years in the publishing industry. She currently oversees all the editorial direction, Organic Life, and Rodale's OrganicLife.com, books, and special interests. With that, thanks again for coming, and I'll pass you over to Melanie. Thank you, and I'll preface that by saying everyone on the panel tonight is going to be from the British colonies. <laughs> you won't hear any other accents. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel, um, and starting um, to my left is Nora Pouillon. She's the chef and founder of America's first organic restaurant. You could say she's a bit of a grandmother of organics in, in America. Um, she's the chef owner of restaurant Nora and Asia Nora and is a real true pioneer in the organic space. Um, and Nora is actually going to be honoured with a really special award in May when she gets a Lifetime Achievement Award from the James Beard Association. Uh, next on our panel is Nicole Nestoiko. Um, and she's the Senior Director of Supply Chain and Sustainability at Kashi. Um, what that actually means is that she looks after the supply chain solutions, workshopping around that new product insights, and she oversees a wide variety of key operations and logistics. Um, her team works with farmers all over the country as well as in Europe um, and Africa as well. Um, to her left is the farmer, Richard Gempele. He's an almond farmer from California and he looks after a lot of parcels of land, some of which are in transition and participating in this transitional program that we hear about today. Um, prior to that, Richard was a hydrologist, which I think is a water nerd, right? 
<laughs> um, and he holds a degree in hydrology. Uh, to his left is Robin O'Brien. She's a consumer advocate, a strategist, a public speaker, and author of The Unhealthy Truth. She was once dubbed as Foods Erin Brockovich. I love this. <laughs> um, and her focus is on the health of the American food system. And she works with a lot of global food companies, food startups, and farming organizations, among a, a whole lot of other stuff, to help build um, the new food economy. And last but not least, to her left, is Dr. Chris Nichols. She is the chief scientist at the Rodell Institute, which is a, a nonprofit dedicated to pioneering organic farm research and outreach. Um, the, the Institute, for those that don't know, have been conducting some of the longest running farm system trials um, in the world where conventional crops are tested against organic crops. Um, Dr. Nichols is a soil nerd, <laughs> um, if I may call her that. Um, she's a leader in the study of soil biology and is recognized um, as a leader in the movement to rebuild the health of our soil um, and sustainability for global food production. So many different facets um, of agriculture on the panel. Now I thought a really nice place to start um, would be um, with Nora and, and working our way down, I would really love you to share with the room what your light bulb moment for organics was. What my what? Your light bulb moment, like the, when you realized that you were, oh. organics was something that you were passionate about and it was important to you. When was that first moment? I hate to say it, but probably over 40 years ago. <laughs> And uh, I think what it was is when I realized, uh, when I came to this country from Austria, you probably detected my accent. My kids say I sound like Arnold. <laughs> but uh, uh, when I came to this country from Austria and I looked into uh, trying to find some local beef to uh, feed my family and I called up this farm and the farm, farmer, the woman told me, oh, I give my animals, you know, uh, antibiotics and feed them corn and I give them cross promoting hormones and I think that was really for me the beginning when I realized food was grown very differently here than where I came from and so I searched out other farmers and I found one farmer in, in, in Pennsylvania who said he does natural beef and uh, I said okay so it exists and so I have to go with that. And uh, when I fed my family with local farmers and uh, uh, tried to find, it was the hippie time, you know, in the 70s. So there were many sort of, you know, food for thought and, and you know, stores where you could find really uh, more natural food and uh, perhaps not organic, but much more related to the soil. And so that's when I decided, when I later did the restaurant, I had to continue doing that and stay in the organic mode because I felt, you know, I cannot kill my customers. <laughs> so you came through organics um, by cooking for your family. Nicole, how did you come to organic? What was your light bulb moment? Yeah, so I've been with Kashi for 15 years. Um, we launched our first product back in 2002 um, that was organic. Kashi's been in business since the mid 80s. But a recent light bulb moment we actually had on a farm as well. Um, about two years ago, some of our team was visiting a farm and speaking with a farmer who said to us, you know, I'd be more likely to support a farmer who is in transition to organic than someone who was already organic. And I would be more likely to buy products that were made from crops that were in transition. Because I know as a farmer just how difficult that transition period is. And so for us as a company, it was our light bulb moment. We went back to the office and said, how can we, how can we illuminate this journey for consumers? How can we share this with consumers? And that's, that's where Certified Transitional was born. Richard, as somebody who works the land, at what point did you decide that you wanted to farm differently? So uh, I think my light bulb moment came the first uh, barn owl box I put up in the field. And I realized it was kind of a, a, a leap of faith at that time 15 years ago. You put up a barn owl box 
and the barn owl will go through the orchard and take care of your rodent problem. And the conventional way to handle that problem is to bait, and, and you know Rachel Carson about baiting, it's gonna go up the food chain and next thing you know you're hurting your, your apex predators. But what I saw was just this phenomenal way to control rodents that was really easy. All you had to do was provide them room and board. And uh, so I saw, okay, this really works. How can I look at my entire system and find similar things that'll work as a whole, the whole, I mean, it's not just rodents, there's a lot of things you need to worry about in, in farming. And it kind of was a light bulb moment to say, I need to research this and look at the whole picture and get towards organic, because this really works. And, and it was just one little thing that, that was the trigger. And the other thing is, from my past life as a hydrologist, invariably as a hydrologist, you're usually working in areas that are, have environmental degradation to a pretty significant extent. So I saw a lot in Europe when I worked there, uh, working on uranium mill tailings ponds and hazardous waste sites and a lot of degradation. So when I came to the farm, I said, we're going to farm in the most sustainable way possible. So it's kind of a combination of the two. A combination of rodents <laughs> and other things. Um, Robin, how about you? What was your moment? So I'm, I'm thinking about your introduction. I have the water nerd here, and I have the soil nerd here, and I was a math nerd, and I was in finance. And I think the universe was trying to get it into my brain that I needed to know about organic before I was even aware. One of the speakers I remember from grad school when I was in business school was John Mackey, the founder and CEO of Whole Foods. Then again, when I was an analyst on a team managing 20 billion in assets, we used to have those same teams come through the office and I still didn't get it. It was just to me at that point a business model, a marketing opportunity, a revenue generator. I didn't understand the value of it. I didn't understand the definition of it. And then we moved to Colorado 17 years ago, and my fourth child had this allergic reaction. And all of a sudden, I was fully awake and fully aware of how illiterate I was. So I could run any numbers and read any spreadsheet, but I couldn't tell anybody anything about how my food was made. And I thought, how is it that somebody can go to school and have this level of education and be this food illiterate? And so it turned on this light bulb, and all of a sudden I realized, you know, I wasn't the only one. And as I began to truly understand the legal definition of what USDA organic meant, you know, again, there's a math equation in there. And right now it doesn't add up. And so if you look at the fact that the organic industry is growing at about 11% a year, four times conventional, and as Lou said, we've got 1% of our farmland to somehow meet that need, the math doesn't add up. And so we're importing a ton, we're importing 1.5 billion in organic, 70% of our soy, organic soy is being imported, 40 to 50% of our organic corn is being imported. So as a math nerd, I look at that and I just think that is awesome economic upside, awesome opportunity for our farmers that we need to take advantage of. And Chris is somebody who works on the science and agriculture side of things. I'm curious how you first came to organics. Well, I guess I would say that um, if you're a true water nerd, you actually are a true soil nerd. And if you eat, you are a soil nerd. So um, <laughs> soil is really the, the foundation of everything. And um, you know, that, that seems like a very short statement to say the foundation of everything, but it really is the foundation of everything. Um, and so I uh, was going through school um, and have been working in research, uh, studying a fungus. I fell in love with the fungus when I was an undergrad. Um, and I tell people this story, it's actually in the wedding vows with my wife that I, I love a fungus and she has to accept that. Um, and, and so, you know, Soil is the foundation for everything. This focus was a big part of it. And um, so really when I was looking at, uh, I have come from a farming background, and um, when I was looking at agriculture and how uh, we could be able to address 
all of the issues that we were looking at, um, really soil became that thing that could um, be able to get the whole system to work. Um, and I, on a personal level, had an uh, issue with thyroid cancer. And um, I'd been doing research for a number of years on this fungus. And uh, it hadn't hit me until I was sick. And your thyroid basically controls your metabolism. And so when it isn't working, you can't do anything. It doesn't matter what you eat, what you, how you exercise how you sleep, anything like that, you just can't do anything. And so it really dawned on me that through the soil, that connection is really carbon and the carbon that the plants will take from the atmosphere and utilize the energy of the sun is really the driver for everything that's happening. And so to be able to look and work with a system that is working on optimizing those drivers rather than coming out and putting other types of inputs into the system, but really optimizing what's happening there. And this fungus that I work with, uh, co-evolved with plants and has been working on getting this process to happen most efficiently for well over 400 million years. And so there's nothing that we can do in uh, science to outcompete that. It's how do we enhance that and work to be able to improve the efficiencies of that process. Thank you for sharing your fungus with us. <laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> So uh, back in the 1950s, um, J.I. Rodale, who's commonly referred to as the grandfather of organics, um, he wrote that organics is not a fad. And we have to remember, this was a really long time ago. It has been a long established practice, much more firmly grounded than the current chemical flair, he said. Present agricultural practices are leading us downhill. Now, when he wrote that, he was considered an absolute loony and a bit of a heretic. Um, and things have changed a lot since then. Um, and I want to throw this open to the panel. You know, where have we come from that time? You know, how has the organic market and the appetite for organics um, evolved over the past decades? Would you like to start, Nora? I can tell you. I can tell you, when I opened the restaurant and said I'm doing an organic restaurant, well, first people say don't call it organic because that sounds like a biology class. So, uh, and it sounds healthy, and healthy food is not, doesn't taste good. But uh, I think that people thought I was completely nuts, like him. <laughs> And it was very difficult then I opened the restaurant in 79 or I was already buying organic food in the 70s. It was very, very difficult to find organic food. And I remember waiting for once a week, the truck came from California with some organic produce. Well, you know, now there are distributors, now I can get organic balsamic vinegar, organic salt, I mean, all these things were really impossible, I think, until I would say uh, the mid-90s, late 90s. And I became certified organic in 99, and I could not have done it any day earlier. So I think it has come a long way. And even so many people ask, when I, they ask me, what kind of restaurant do you have? And I said, well, it's a new American cuisine with, with uh, it's cert certified organic ingredients. They say, you know, between, uh, oh, I'm vegetarian too. <laughs> 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 or uh, is it vegetarian? Do you sell them? Do you have meat? Do you have, you know? So I think it has become, has come a very long way. I think it's the public still needs a lot of education and information because uh, people, you know, now they don't say things like this, but they tell, ask me, what really does it mean to be certified organic? You know, they, they, they say, oh, I know I have a friend, he has an organic restaurant too. And if I say, well, what, what is organic? They say, well, he uses local farmers. So there is a lot of uh, not understanding really what certified organic means and to what extent it is uh, difficult to do and to what extent um, you know, it is important because I think it's good for the environment and it's for good for us people. And uh, I know it's pricier, 
But I always tell people I prefer to spend my money on food than on the doctor. And right you are. <laughs> That's a really interesting perspective from a, from a restaurant and a chef's point of view. What about from the point of view of a food company, Nicole? How have you seen this appetite for organics change in the last decade or so that you've been involved? Yeah, so um, 15 years ago we launched our first organic product and um, we were among the first packaged food brands on the shelf with that certified organic label. And now, you know, I think you can find everything organic balsamic vinegar, as Nora, as Nora mentioned. Um, so we would, you know, seeing that growth and being a part of that industry growth, um, now we're at a point where, again, um, less than 1% of U.S. farmland is still uh, you know, it's only less than less than one percent is organic, and so it's a bit of a head scratcher. And that's where certified transitional comes in for us to to help address and solve that problem. So we've launched these products, and we hope to see that market grow in the same way that we've seen the organic market grow, because we know that that will help fuel organic farmland over time. And how do you think, um, and you know, this, I might throw this over to you, Robin, um, what have been some of the biggest barriers for consumers um, when it comes to buying and cooking and eating organic? You know, I think food is so much more than just food. I mean, food is family, it's tradition, it's religion, it's social, it's economic. And for me and my family, coming out of a really conservative family in Texas, it was a hippie thing. You know, and, and I hadn't realized when I started to explore and educate in this space that it would challenge a belief system that I had been raised in. And I think to have that awareness now that this is and can be a very sensitive issue personally, that mothers can feel judged if a daughter feels something different or they don't understand or the grandparents aren't quite on board yet. And I think trying to convert somebody from conventional to organic is, is sometimes can feel like trying to convert somebody from one religion to another. Mm -hmm. The belief systems can be that deep. But what I have seen in the last 20 years, especially in the last decade, is that the statistics and what is happening to the health of our families, when you have the president's cancer panel telling us that one in two men are expected to get cancer and one in three women, that cancer is the leading cause of death by disease in American kids, one in three Caucasian kids born in the year 2000, which is my daughter's 11th grade class, and one in two minority kids in that same class are expected to be insulin dependent by the time they get, a, get to adulthood. And because of that, and I was one of those statistics with the kids with food allergies, because of that, I was forced to wake up. And so where maybe 10 years ago, we sort of had this choice, and it felt like a privilege to get to choose organic, Today, the choice is, how do I get this stuff out of my kid's diet? We don't have the long-term studies. We don't know what the long-term impact is. And what you've seen is that the consumer has self-educated largely. What we're now seeing is the corporations are partnering with her and saying, how can we help you? It used to be, Nicole and I were just talking about this, it used to be that the companies back in the 90s kind of told us what to think. Now with social media, we're telling them what we need. And that dialogue and that conversation is so important and so powerful. And so I think you know we're in a really exciting time right now because the consumer's awake, the corporations are now awake, it is being driven by one of the most sincere emotions out there, and that is love. And it is people out there trying to figure out how to shop for a family member that's been hit by one of these conditions. There is nothing more sincere than that. And if we can figure out how to harness that, this thing's unstoppable. And so I think what Kashi is doing, what Rich is doing, what organizations around the country are doing, it's how do we harness that and really drive this change and accelerate it in a way that can drive this impact. Chris, you work for an organization that is all about encouraging organic agriculture and farming. Um, how, have you, how has that changed over the last few decades? I know that, you know, obviously JI had a lot of pushback at the time, a lot of farmers, you know, 
still push back even now, but what have you seen change? Well, I think um, from both the farming side uh, and sort of as a farmer's daughter, I have seen the fact that farmers are, I always say, as I was growing up, farmers are by nature thinkers and tinkerers, and, and they like to, to innovate, and they like to, to come up with new things. And especially uh, during dying times in the season, they're, they're always thinking. Um, and, and so what happened with conventional agriculture with the, the chemical use, and that was you know, part of the issue and why J.I. designed the Rodale Institute was because uh, the university systems, land-grant universities were all looking at these conventional inputs as the way that was, that was the new future, that was the new science. This was the things that, that we were supposed to do and everybody was supposed to go along with that. Um, but what it did was it took away the innovation, I think, on the part of the farmers. And so we're finding farmers now that, I, I always say my dad has owned the farm since the year I was born, and I think that, uh, you know, over my whole entire lifetime, I don't think I've ever seen him really have fun farming. Uh, until uh, the last few years. And we were actually, I just saw him last week and we were having a conversation. We were driving around rural Minnesota and Iowa and things like that, so a lot of time in the car to talk. And I was talking to him about this and, and he said, you know what, I really am like the, a person on an assembly line when you're in conventional agriculture because you're just you know, putting widgets together. There wasn't any real innovation. You just did what you were told. You followed that cookbook. And that is really a thing that I think that farmers are, the consumer side of things is, is driving some changes, but there's also a lot of farmers that are driving those changes because they want something more. And in order to be able to get uh, their children to come back onto the farm, I was talking with your daughter and asking her if she was gonna go back to the farm. And so in order to be able to get people to come back to the farm, it needs to have, it needs to be fun again. And I think the same thing is also happening on a science side. So if I can, you know, just take a moment to talk about, you know, the, the science side of things is there's so much that, that we're learning all of the time about, um, you know, the, the, the soil again is this foundation for everything and we've had these systems for millions of years but we know so little about how this works. I tell people when I started school that we talked about the fact we knew about 10% of the organisms that were in the soil. We could culture them and identify them and know what they would do. By the time I finished graduate school, we said we knew about 0.1%. And so that number keeps going backwards as we're learning about the complexity of the system. And as we learn more about the human microbiome and the connections between the food we're eating and how the organisms in our gut are processing that food and being able to utilize that food. It's also driving those connections to what we're seeing in the soil. And so really this is, this is something that when I go to scientific meetings and are talking to scientists uh, and, and talking to graduate students and young people, this is the new frontier that people are looking at. Agriculture used to be a lot of the land grant universities got rid of their agricultural programs. They're land grant universities. That's their foundation was, was farming and agriculture. And they had to get rid of their agricultural programs. They would combine them with other programs because students weren't interested in doing that anymore. And now we're seeing, I think, this whole innovation change where we're looking at the fact that, you know, organic agriculture, people would look at it and again, you know, sort of be the, the, the hippie phase of things and all of those types of things. And they would say, well, you know, it's going backwards and you're not going to be, you know, utilizing all of these modern tools and those types of things. And that's what we're doing. That's the type of research that we're trying to do is how can we utilize these tools to be able to use these systems that are actually going to solve of the issues that we're seeing with things like super weeds, with pest populations, with climatic uncertainty. All of these types of things are issues that the soil foundation we're learning as we learn more about the soil microbiome can help to solve that. Well, it sounds like an awesome way of farming. But so, Richard, what are the barriers though? You know, like it, it seems like such common sense, but obviously it's not as easy as it sounds. What are, what are the barriers for farmers transitioning or even contemplating going organic? And what are some of the issues that you faced? It, it actually is, it, it's, it was a surprising statistic that only 1% or less than 1% was inorganic. It's, it, I do understand, you know, the reluctance of conventional farmers making that leap. It's, 
you know, pardon the pun, but it's a tough road to hoe. <laughs> it's, it's a much more difficult way of farming. You have to have a really solid organic system plan, well thought out in advance, because there's no quick fixes later. And the, the problem with the organic, when, when you look at farming and, and sustainability is a big buzzword now. And sustainability has many components. It's an economic component and a biological component. You could split it up like that. And when you look at the economic component of sustainability, you're looking at a period of three years where you have, granted, I'm looking through uh, the lens of a specialty crop grower in the Central Valley of the rogue state of California. So. I have a very limited lens of what I'm looking at when I talk about agriculture. But what we experience is rising produ production costs, rising labor costs, coupled against decreasing yields. And so over a three year period, that cumulative, uh, that cumulative effect can be kind of daunting because you ha there's a certain uh, a risk aversion that you, you know, that inherently you have in business. And you can I, what I see happening to confront that barrier is a diversification model. But of course, now we have a premium program where you know, it's a much easier bridge to, to, to gap. And then on top of that, when I talk about the sustainability and the barriers, on the environmental side or the biological side, each commodity will have its own barrier that they're going to have to, it's a high bar, they're going to have to figure it out. You know, in almonds it might be weed control, and someone else it might be a specific pest that they won't, will be very difficult to handle on a biological level. So that's what I'm seeing as some of the main barriers. So I guess this is where certified transitional comes in. Mm -hmm. um, Nicole, can you? You know, tell us a little more, what is it and how is it helping solve that challenge that Richard talks about? Sure, so last year, um, we, I told you the farm story, the idea, you know, where the idea came from um, in our intro. But last year, Kashi worked with QAI. After we had this idea, we went back to the office and thought, how do we bring this to life and how do we make this something that will truly make an impact um, beyond Kashi? So we knew it had to be, to scale, it had to be bigger than us. We decided to work with QAI, they're a trusted partner who we use to certify um, many of our organic products, to develop, to kind of co-develop this standard called Certified Transitional, which um, basically from the farm all the way to the store certifies a product is transitional. So the crop, Richard's almonds are transitional, and then we handle it in a way um, through the supply chain all the way to the consumer shelf so that it can get that label of certified transitional um, on the product. So for us, you know, yes, it is a label. Yes, there are some products, but it's a lot more than that. We want this to be a movement. We want this to be bigger than Kashi. We never wanted this to just be about us because we know less than 1% is organic. The organic industry is being propped up by imports. And this is, a, this is a tool, we believe this is a tool to solve this problem. And I think you're absolutely right when you talk about scale, because you know, the key to change is, is scale and getting that momentum. So I'm curious how um, peers and other companies will be encouraged to take on you know, this initiative, or how will it be incentivized? Yeah, to welcome we, um, more comers. We sent a lot of gift gift bags to people. <laughs> no, <laughs> no we, um, we've done a lot of reach out with our, our peer companies and brands. We have conversations, I think, every week or so with somebody new who's interested in the idea. Um, and, you know, QAI has, has fielded, I think, two dozen inquiries on people who are considering taking this up. So um, I think that, and then I, additionally, as we launch more products and as those products are successful in market, and as we do events and reach out, and we have an ad campaign this week talking about certified transitional that Richard's featured in, um, I think that's, that's our idea of getting, getting the message out and getting the word out to others to join us on this movement. And Richard, do you think this will be a game changer for a lot of farmers out there who are considering going in this direction? 
It's absolutely a game changer for our operation. I mean, it comes down to an, you know, an equation of penciling it out where you have the, the different, uh, uh, again, that economic barrier and having that bridge to gap that, that three-year period. Yeah. Um, I guess some of the other early criticism of this label when it was first announced was it kind of, I guess, the potential to confuse consumers. Um, you know, there's a lot of labels on packaging already, and it's like, oh, wow, how do we cut through the noise? Um, Robin, from a consumer point of view, what would you what would you say to those kind of comments? So when I was when I was first realizing that less than one percent of our farmland is organic, it was actually from leaders inside of General Mills and Annie's, and they were struggling. And that was when I realized that even if the CEO of this multinational company 100% believed in organic food, wasn't just hedging, just 100% wanted to go that direction, he couldn't because the supply chain wasn't there. And so I began to study the different ways that people were trying to address the need. And we have the Organic Trade Association, which was trying to work directly with the farmers. You had Nature's Path. They're actually buying farmland. You had Kroger, which is a huge piece of the story now. You know, they were developing it. And everybody was sort of focusing on their own supply chain, which makes a ton of sense in that business model. What I loved the most about the Kashi model was that the consumer was part of the solution. Because as somebody who gets in front of these consumers every single day and in front of parents every single day, the question I always get is, what can I do? And so when Lou and Nicole called on this, I said, this is brilliant because you're letting somebody put love into action. And that is so powerful. And it's, you know, if I'm 100% all in organic, I'm still gonna buy one of those boxes because it's gonna help a guy like Rich. And so asking that consumer maybe, hey, once, you know, put one of these boxes in every time you're in the grocery store, or have you bought your five boxes this month? You know, what is it that you're doing? That was my first part that I loved. The second part that I loved was that they weren't trying to own it exclusively all out for Kashi. That they as a team recognized that this had to be a collaborative effort. And as a consumer, I thought, okay, this is a team. We're a team trying to tra transition these farmlands. And so I think it makes a lot of sense because it's the first consumer-facing transition logo. And when everybody asks, what can I do, what can I, what can I do, the more we see that logo on products, the faster we're going to get that 1% to 5% to 10% to 20%. And how are we going to educate those consumers about what that logo means? Nicole? Sure. Well, um, I think for, for us, uh, we talk about how do we get consumers to buy these products, and we have to make them delicious and nutritious first. And then we have you know, a sustainability story on the back about certified transitional. So um, it's difficult to lead with this story. It's a little bit complicated. It's a lot to digest. Um, so I think we've made extremely delicious food, if I do say so myself, that is also certified transitional. So I think that's our approach. That's the way that, that we're handling it. Um, and you know, I think there probably are a lot of different ways to go about it, but that's, mm. that's, our, that's our way. I think Nora would agree with you that it always starts with flavor, right? <laughs> I, I, think, I think that it, it's a great idea. It's a great idea because I, uh, I started farmers markets in Washington DC and I deal a lot with farmers and I'm always upset when they are not certified organic, when they're not organic. And they, I think a program like that would really you know, encourage them to become certified organic because for most of them it is they cannot afford the three years you know, where they don't have um, perhaps the quantity of the crop or uh, they have to you know, raise their price. And so I think the more, the better, because one of the big hurdles, I think, in, uh, in organic food is the price for many people. And I think the more farmers grow organic, the cheaper it will get and the more people can afford it. And I think it should be food that can, everybody can afford. Which probably brings me to my next and final point in, you know, in, in wrapping this up is, you know, how do we democratize organics? You know, you touched on price, but um, Robin, would you jump in? 
So I think what happened to our food system is it was centralized by a chemical company. And Monsanto, when they introduced this business model 20 years ago, they're a chemical company that was trying to sell more chemicals, so they genetically engineered the seed to withstand more chemicals. And as a chemical, chemical company, if I were one of their shareholders, I would have been really excited about that. It made a lot of sense. But it centralized control of farming into the hands of that chemical system. And then the farmers became indentured servants into that model. And they lost their autonomy, they lost their creativity, they lost that ability to innovate that had any meaning to their farm. And so I think the solution is how do we decentralize? How do we take that power back? How do we give it back to the states? How do we give it back to that local level? And you see it. I mean, Nora's a great example of this. You see these farm to table restaurants. She was one of the first in the country, if not the very first. And now you go into any city in the US and you've got farm to table. And I think, again, you cannot forget how powerful our voices are. And that when you see somebody doing the right thing, whether it's a restaurant, whether it's a farmer's market, whether it's a farmer, whether it's a grocery store, you thank them. Because that gratitude pays it forward and continues it. So I think you know what we have, the challenge in front of us is, the last 20 years, the food system got centralized by this chemical company. That chemical company has just sold itself to a company in Germany. So in a way, that lid's been taken back off. And in that, we have an opportunity to come in and build a better food system. It's gonna require partnership, private and public. It's gonna require corporations getting involved. It's like turning the Titanic. We're gonna need all hands on deck. And then as we do, as we create that market, as that revenue grows, policy will follow the money. And DC will eventually get on board. But you know, I do think the opportunity right now is in the marketplace. You see all of these different companies coming to the table trying to create these solutions. You see the consumer coming to the table and asking why. You know, you even now, the American Academy of Pediatrics had to issue a statement paper on organics because so many parents were coming into these offices asking about it and they hadn't been schooled 20 or 30 years ago. So you step back and you know, the, big, the big myth, I think, is that we needed this genetically engineered, chemically intensive operating system to feed the world. That is an awesome PR story for a chemical company. But 20 years ago, we were fine. And today, according to the USDA, we throw away 30 to 40% of the food that we produce. We're good on production. We need smarter distribution models, and we need to decentralize. I'm into that. <laughs> um, on that note, I'd like to thank all our panelists for their nerdy insights. Um, even though we are wrapping up the panel portion of this, you are now free to mingle with all our nerds um, and talk to them about anything you want. <laughs> and we hope that you can join us for some more food, for some more drinks and some more conversation. But thank you for coming.